How are you, Richard? <laughs> good. Hi, Annabelle. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see you. Well, it was interesting. I thought a lot about you over the weekend when John Lewis was down in Selma, Alabama. That's where we met, literally at Brown Chapel, which was this extraordinary place for the civil rights movement. And it's where we met to help with the Doug Jones campaign, that Senate election there. And, and of course, where John Lewis started that march across the Edmund Pettus, Pettus Bridge, which hopefully very soon will be renamed the John Lewis Bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually, why don't you take a minute to explain what you were doing in Selma? <laughs> so here's the thing. We don't celebrate elections and election day, right? We are social beings, right? Elections should be fun. They should be parties. They should be get togethers. And because I knew that the Doug Jones um, Roy Moore special election in Alabama, which pitted a really good Democrat who was really fighting hard for civil rights his whole life against Roy Moore, who was allegedly a pedophile and certainly not a civil rights activist. And it was going to come down to a few votes. Alabama is a predominantly very, very, very red state. So I came up with this idea that all we have to do is make it more fun for African-Americans in Alabama to get out and vote. And so I raised a bunch of money from some Democratic donors who were very generous, and we got a bunch of money for food. And we gave this money to three Black churches, uh, Black AME churches, including the Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama. And they were serving catfish and fried chicken and all sorts of fixings based mm -hmm. upon what their church members would love. And so they came in and they had to wear a, an I voted uh, button, a little sticker to, to get in line. And we fed hundreds, as you saw, hundreds and hundreds of people. And it was mm -hmm. all to turn election day into a celebration, vote and then celebrate or come and eat. And then we'll encourage you to go vote if you didn't. And Doug Jones won that election across the pretty large state of Alabama by only 22,000 votes. So not just for what I did, but it was the African-American community coming together. And I think we need to do that. In fact, I'm working right now with a group of DJs, like garage DJs across the country to create a, a celebration and maybe even go out in their cars outside of election polling stations and start little dance parties. So again, elections are fun, they're cool, it's a chance for the community to come together. And if we do that, mm -hmm. uh, the will of the people will be exercised and um, we will win. We will defeat the voter suppression that one party in particular seems to really, really rely on. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it was extraordinary. In fact, I'm gonna drop this live stream I did with you when I met you um, at that event. So and, and the funny thing is I showed up because I was staying with friends um, and documenting their work, getting out the vote. And everyone I talked to on that block said, oh, you have to go get yourself some chicken and fish. You know, I'm like, what, <laughs> what, what, what's happening? And so I stopped by because everyone told me I had to go get some food. Oh there. my God, that's how I met you? Is yeah. We were, we were feeding you? Yeah. That's so what I a, showed what a, up and I was really blown away and I, I thought it was genius what you were doing. Um, and and I think it, it really had impact. I well, really do. What, yeah, it had impact. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you did a great job of documenting that. And one of the highlights of my life was standing behind the same podium at Brown Chapel that Martin Luther King gave that mm -hmm. his speech before they went and marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. I mean, what incredible history, right? Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, it was, it, was a, it was a little bit difficult for me because I've been a vegetarian for 34 years <laughs> to be yeah. paying for catfish and chicken was not my, yeah. not my, my jam, but it was yeah. worth it. <laughs> yeah. I'm also vegetarian. Um, and I think I did have like biscuits and 
fruits and vegetables. But coleslaw. but in any case, yeah, coleslaw. So coleslaw yeah, I was that. great. I yeah. kept going back for coleslaw. You know, after everybody had eaten, I, I went <laughs> right. and a lot of but coleslaw. I, but but that insight into making elections social, a celebration and making it a social event as opposed to just something boring thing you have to do by yourself right that feels very procedural i think that's genius and i think we and we did something together for econo lamb's campaign in pennsylvania serving pizza right to that's to right we did the pizza we followed yeah. up on that and then and then we did facebook lives right so in other words hey yes. everyone i'm out here i just voted the polls are open for two more hours come on out and then you can get some pizza or even if you don't have pizza just to have it go viral within your own Facebook or Instagram community. Exactly. Oh, by the way, you can follow some of the comments on the talk on Main Street, but um, Abraham is saying, that's a great idea in borderlines bribery. Um, and every community should carry on their duty, but it's time to go above and beyond to mobilize voters. And Ellen's saying, no time for complacency, time for action, because uh, she's responding to the title. But why don't we go right into that issue, complacency? Because that, yeah. um, I, I shared something that you wrote about warning people against complacency. So why don't you explain that? Yeah, I, I wanna make one very profound point. Uh, and, and I've been in politics since I was 16. I, I live it, I breathe it, I write it, and this election is, absolutely the most important election I've ever been involved with. But I was warning both in writing on the Huffington Post and talking to people in the White House and a lot of, in a lot of other ways, I was warning people that Donald Trump could win and for a lot of reasons. So I'm gonna say this very, very clear. I don't care how much he is up in the polls right now. Donald, uh, Joe Biden is, Donald Trump can win. I'm going to repeat it. Donald Trump can win. Yeah. And uh, you were frozen he, for a second. So, so sorry. We probably missed it. So I'll say it again. Donald Trump can win. And there are a number of ways that he can win. And I'd be happy to go into that. Happens in terms of how people fill out the ballot and what is tabulated on November 3rd. And so there's no sense in which polling means we're winning. And I, if people are getting very complacent, like we're going to win because the approval ratings are low and so on, we're not winning. And so that's, that's kind of the message that I would like to get across to people that, and, and I agree with you about, totally agree with you about the complacency. So let me, first of all, Hillary was way up at this time in 2016, Michael Dukakis around this time was up by 17 points over George H.W. Bush, right? Donald Trump has many, many tricks up his sleeve, including something that was in the news today. He's gonna do an October surprise, right? That's what Trump did with Rudy Giuliani, where James Comey was somehow informed that there were 30,000 emails that they just found. That was all part of an October surprise plan, I believe, by Rudy Giuliani and the Republicans. And there have been other October surprises throughout history. Donald Trump is already spending your tax dollars to buy millions and millions and millions of doses of coronavirus vaccines. Most likely, these vaccines will be crap maybe even dangerous, maybe even fatal, but it doesn't matter. Donald Trump, according to my friend, Dr. John Gartner, is a sadist. He literally does not have the psychology, the, the, the neurology to care about other people. And he will sacrifice people for his own personal gain. That's what narcissistic personality disorder is about. And he has an extreme case of it. So what he's going to say right before the election is we now have, and he can tell the FDA, he can tell his own FDA to approve something. And if they say, no, Mr. President, it's not ready, he can fire the head of the FDA and put in someone else who will say that and then keep going until he finds someone to do it. So we already know how he runs his government. It is a dictatorship, an authoritarian 
dictatorship and everybody is afraid of him and they will do what he wants. So he's going to get FDA approval, my prediction, right before the election. He's going to say, as he always says, what, you know, Annabelle, it's perfect. It's the best vaccine ever developed, 100%. He is not bounded by the truth. Chris Wallace proved that in that great interview a week ago. And then he's going to say, and I alone can make sure that every single American gets this vaccine and it's not screwed up by Joe Biden and the Democrats because they don't really care and they're going to do all these things that are going to keep you from saving your life and getting this vaccine. So that's just one way that everything can flip. So you can be up eight, nine, 10 points, even in a state like Florida, and you put this snake oil salesperson you know, messaging out there and people are going to be affected by it. It's Donald Trump is the most talented con man in the history, at least in modern history. And then there are some other ways that legally, legally, he can flip the vote of a state that Joe Biden won. You want me to go into that? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Electoral College is this horrible thing, and we will be able to get rid of it through something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. But let's imagine this scenario. Let's say Joe Biden wins Florida, and he's ahead in Florida, but let's say Joe Biden wins Florida by a million votes, half a million votes. And they, they're all ready to certify a Biden election, and then Biden will get these 29 electoral votes, and if he wins Florida, very likely he wins, he gets over 270. But then Governor Ron DeSantis says, whoa, 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 hold on. And the Republican Secretary of State says, hold on. And the Republican legislature says, hold on. And they challenge the vote count because they say, and Donald Trump's been telecasting this strategy already for, for months, you know, that mail-in ballots are fraudulent that there's no way to have an honest, fair election if you have mail-in ballots, right? So DeSantis stays firm. He does Donald Trump's bidding. He continues to be the Donald Trump puppet. And they challenge the, uh, the, the electors that have been elected by the people of the state of Florida. And they submit their own. They say, no, we are contesting the Biden slate of electors. And here are the electors that we believe uh, should be in place to represent the state of Florida because Joe Biden didn't win. And so there's all sorts of legal things that can go on with the Florida State Supreme Court, maybe up to, this, to the US Supreme Court. But uh, if it's still in contention, right, on January 6th of 2021, when the Congress certifies the election, what happens is it goes to the House to determine which slate of electors, is it the Biden electors who get the 29 electoral votes, their votes count, or is it the Trump electors? The House, if it's still Democratic, which it likely will be, says, of course, it's Biden. But here's the thing, Annabelle, unless we take back the Senate, the Mitch McConnell Republican Senate would say, no, we believe that there was voter fraud in Florida, even if it's a half a million, a million, it doesn't matter. I mean, Trump thought there were 3 million illegal aliens voting in California. So scale is not a relevant issue here. We say that we should count the Trump ballot, the Trump electors. So what happens in that situation? It's a little unclear, but there's a law from the 1800s, which seems to indicate that the governor of the state the governor of the state that is contesting that, in this case, it would be Ron DeSantis, gets to choose. So, boom, DeSantis chooses Trump, Trump wins. Mm -hmm. Or another interpretation is they don't count the state at all, which means that yeah. you, drop those, you drop those 29 electoral votes, take them out of Joe Biden's margin of victory, that probably drops him below the 270, it goes into the House of Representatives, and right now, there are more Republican states, state delegations, than there are Democratic. And unless we flip the House in this way, which is not very many more congressmen that we need to do it, but if we don't, then the House of Representatives will officially elect Donald Trump president of the United States. So again, 
we have the bottom line is we cannot mm -hmm. be complacent, right? Yeah. Polling does not mean anything now. There are PR moves, uh, con man moves that Donald Trump has up his sleeve guaranteed. He's gonna suppress the heck out of the vote, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in swing states. I believe he's going to use hackers and others to flip voting machines so that even when you vote for, for Joe Biden, it may not show up that way. And he's gonna have a post-election legal constitutional um, electoral college strategy that is going to be devastating and it's going to go on for a long time. The answer, there's an answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is not to be freaked out, like you said in your post today. The answer is for every single human being to vote. And that means you people who are Bernie or bust. And that means you young people who don't like Joe Biden. And that means you people who want to vote for a Green Party candidate. And that means you part of the 100 million people that didn't vote last time. If we overwhelm the system, so instead of half a million votes or even a million votes in Florida, let's say it's 2 million. It's gonna make mm -hmm. it much harder for John Roberts, if it gets to him, to agree with Ron DeSantis that there was voter fraud. It's gonna make it much harder for Donald Trump to steal the election. And for example, if exit polls in Michigan show that Biden won by 11% and the electronic voting machines show that Trump won by 1%, mm -hmm. that's going to, I think, be very relevant for the Supreme Court where it will ultimately go to go, hold on here. Um, we're going to we're going to not allow that voter fraud to continue or that that election fraud or the flipping machines. Anyway, bottom line, we're going to have a mess. We're going to mm -hmm. it's going to be a mess. But the only thing that we can do is what we should be doing anyway, whether you're getting catfish or fried chicken or not. And that is we have to all <laughs> literally get out and vote. Yeah. Um, let me ask you something. Can you elaborate on what you were saying about the Senate again? Because I think that's a really important point here. So. Right. So okay. we know that the House of Representatives, if no one gets above the 270 or above, the House of Representatives literally elects the president. Right. And it is not done by how many congressmen there are. So, for example, in California, we have 52 members of Congress, but we only get one vote. Wyoming has one member of Congress. They get one vote. So right now we have 26 state delegations that are Republican. We have 23 that are Democratic and one Pennsylvania, which is tied at 9-9. So we need to flip a couple of those Republican delegations to make sure that if it does go to the House, that we can still win. The Senate is only going to be involved in this election if there is a contested electoral college slate. In other words, as I, I said before... You have either Ron DeSantis in Florida or uh, Greg Abbott in Texas mm -hmm. or, or Brian Kemp in Georgia or Doug Ducey in Arizona saying, hey, even though it looks like Biden won, we're contesting. That could, depending on le the legal pathway, that could end up in the United States Senate. If we flip, here's the important one, we should be doing this anyway. How many of you love Mitch McConnell, right? I mean, he is destroyed democracy in the United States Congress more than any other human being in American history. So we can get rid of McConnell and the Trump enabling Republicans by flipping uh, three seats, right? It's 47-53, we flip three, we get to 50-50, right? And then we have a vice president who is a Democrat, Vice President Kamala Harris or Val Demings or whoever, who would then cast the deciding tie-breaking vote. But mm -hmm. we don't get there on January 6th. Here's the tricky thing. The new Congress is brought in and sworn in on January 3rd. So we can flip the Senate on January 3rd, but we don't get the vice president until January 20th. So between January 3rd and January 20th, if, for example, I'm going to mention something that's very sad for many people to even think about, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg leaves the, the, the Supreme Court for whatever reason, between January 3rd and January 20th, unless we flip the Senate, 
Donald Trump would be able to put in another Brett Kavanaugh. So that's how important oh, that's my the gosh. timing. Yeah, the timing mm-hmm. is bizarre. The truth Woo! is Ruth has, oh, you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, oh my God, that's just scary as hell. Ah. There's 17 days where we have a new Congress, but the old president, right? It's kind of screwed up. Um, but the thing is, if we flip the Senate, right? We need four right? <laughs> until January 20th. So if we flip four seats, then we were 5149 and Brian Camp or Ron DeSantis, um, you know, made the objection, a, a Democratic Senate would say, no, sorry, Joe Biden's win stands, right? So it's all very intricate. It all comes back to exactly the same point. And that point is vote, vote, vote. And if God forbid, you're not willing to vote for Joe Biden for whatever reason, and I've heard young people tell me that all day long, um, then at least vote for a senator who can stand up to Donald Trump and can replace Mitch McConnell and vote for a congressperson, right? And vote for your own state legislators or whoever's on the ballot. But yeah, that's the summary. We are we are in for one of the most interesting from a legal and constitutional standpoint, interesting elections of all time, unless unless it is a massive, massive blowout, which means everybody's got to vote. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that I worry about the most is that it's just gonna be hard for people to vote. So even yeah, just getting to that point where people have filled out the right applications, um, we're going to have 28 million people who could be homeless because of evictions. Um, right. It's it's just going to be hard for people to vote. And 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 the mail-in ballots, like I requested an absentee ballot for the Virginia primary, and I got sent the wrong ballot. I got sent the Republican ballot, so I couldn't participate unless I I drove an hour to to vote at the polling station. So that's what I ended up doing. But I'm just so many things could go wrong just getting people to participate at all. So even if there's like, all of us are saying, yes, 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 we need to get rid of Trump and vote for Biden. Um, they may not really get a chance to because there's so many procedural right. hurdles. And so that's another concern I have. Um, right. So well, there's a, um, what do you there's say to, to that? Yeah. 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 Listen, that that is absolutely a huge concern. Right. And no one should diminish that. But there are a couple of things that we can do proactively, right? So every state under the constitution controls their own elections. So they have different rules, different voter registration deadlines, different when you have to apply for absentee ballot, how you have to apply for it, all of that, right? So you need to check out, and maybe what you can do on your page, Annabelle, is we can put you know, different links and there are organizations that, that really specialize this in this. But here's the bottom line. First of all, register register, register. If you're not registered, do that. The, the deadline for that is generally 30 days before the election. Um, and then apply for an absentee ballot, right? Just do it as soon as possible. Get it and, and fill it out and turn it in at the first opportunity that you can. If there is early voting, do the early voting, right? And then if not, just be willing to stand in line, right? Bring some pizza for other people right? Bring some fried chicken if that's what you want or some catfish, whatever. And we need to come together as a community because, for example, I was saying I live in Los Angeles in a very nice polling station with mainly white people. It was a two-hour wait. So, you know, the thing is, this is your one thing to do. John Lewis literally got his head cracked open so that he and his brothers and sisters would have the right to vote. If you're gonna have to stand in a line for a couple of hours eating pizza and fried chicken or not, I somehow think that's less of a contribution to the world, less of a sacrifice than John Lewis did. And it's just something we have to do. And I really, when I looked at Wisconsin and all the people during the middle of the COVID crisis who were standing in line, right? God bless you, right? So, the, but that's the last resort. So absentee ballot, early voting, and make sure you're registered. 
So Richard, like, what can we do right now to make sure that we don't have four hour, five hour, eight hour lines in places like Florida? Right, uh, again, I am almost certain that in Republican states that are controlled by Republican governors and Republican secretaries of state, you are gonna have lines, right? But if you don't wanna be inconvenienced by a line, do what I just said, get an absentee ballot or vote, for, or vote, vote early, right? And we should all do that to take the pressure off of the lines on election day. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. very simple. But then I, I, I go back to my last statement, which is, and if you have to stand in line, I think the next four years of mm -hmm. not having Donald Trump is worth whatever sacrifice we can make on one day. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, another thing I want to point out is um, we have some comments on the thread right now from people who are either never Biden, you know, one person saying never Biden, another person saying we don't want more neoliberalism, you know, unless uh, Biden picks somebody like Warren, someone who's truly progressive, um, then you know, it's more or less it's, it's, it's a reason for a lot of people to not vote. Um, and so I just right. want to ask you to respond to that never Biden or we're very, wow. very unhappy with Biden sentiment. Okay, out there. so so here's the thing, and I'm going to send this to you, Annabelle, and you can post it. I wrote a piece called RBG and 29 other reasons to vote for Joe Biden, even if you hate him. And I want to share a couple of those. Ready? So we can go around and around about how horrible Joe Biden is or how he isn't and the crime bill and his inappropriate behavior and all of that. My overall comment is, unfortunately, we have a two party system now. Maybe we can change that at some point, but for now we have only two people who are likely to be elected and that is Donald Trump and Joe Biden. If you can honestly, in that prefrontal cortex part of your brain, say that they're about the same, then awesome, that's great. But then there are 30 reasons that you should probably seriously consider voting for Joe Biden, even if you hate his guts, even if you think he's worse than Donald Trump. I'll give you a couple. Do you like Betsy DeVos? Probably you don't. Well, guess what? Joe Biden will appoint an education secretary who is not Betsy DeVos. Do you like Bill Barr as attorney general? Well. If you're a progressive, you probably don't. Joe Biden, I promise you, promise you, promise you, will appoint an attorney general who is not like Bill Barr. He may not be as progressive as you want, right? Maybe it's Kamala Harris who you have some issues with as well if she's not VP, right? But it will not be Bill Barr, right? Do you believe in climate change? Or do you want coal company executives, oil company executives, fracking company executives to run the Environmental Protection Agency as they are doing now and the Interior Department? Joe Biden will appoint an administrator of the EPA and a Secretary of Interior who are not coal or oil fossil fuel company executives. Do you want to create more renewable energy technology? Joe Biden will sign that bill. It's called HR9, and he will get us back into the uh, Paris Climate Accords. Do you want to get rid of money in politics and have, have um, automatic voter registration and have real transparency on corporations and how much money they give it to elections? That's HR1, the Government for the People Act. Joe Biden will sign that. Do you want dreamers to be able to have a path to citizenship? That's HR 6. Joe Biden will sign that. Do you want um, the Equality Act, right? So that gay LGBTQ people are not ever discriminated against legally in the United States. That's HR 5. Joe Biden will sign that. Donald Trump won't. And here's the biggest thing. Do you want someone like Brett Kavanaugh or Neil Gorsuch to be the fifth radical right-wing, what I refer to as fascist member of the Supreme Court, or do you want someone like a Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Now, Joe Biden, even if you hate his guts, has said that he will appoint 
an African-American woman if he has an opportunity to fill a seat on the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 87 years old. God hope that she lives until another president, right? And another Senate. But if Donald Trump gets reelected, the chances of Ruth Bader Ginsburg with four or now five, I believe, cancer bouts, making it four more years, I wouldn't count on that. I hope she lives forever. I think she's one of the greatest Americans ever. But sure. if, in, if in fact, Joe Biden, uh, Donald Trump gets to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg with another far right Trumpist, we would then have five members of the Supreme Court who are far right fascists. Do you know how many members of the Supreme Court there are, Annabelle? Nine, right? Right, and so five would be what? What do you mean? Five would be what? Five would be a majority. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only reason we have gotten some decent rulings out of the Supreme Court lately is because John Roberts mm -hmm. has been has been a swing vote and he's been pretty liberal on a few things or at least moderate. Right. If, in fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg gets replaced with another Brett Kavanaugh, another Clarence mm -hmm. Thomas, another Samuel Alito, another Neil Gorsuch, that would be five, which means that everyone else could stay home. You would have five super right fascists. You would have three Democrats who are progressive and you would have one uh, moderate John Roberts, which means every single thing that you hold near and dear, if you are a progressive who hates Joe Biden will be gone, right? Roe v. Wade will be overturned. Gay marriage could be overturned. Everything could be made in the image of Donald Trump and Clarence Thomas. So I think that the intelligent way and maybe you can dismiss what I'm saying. Okay, boomer. Okay, boomer. You don't get it. You don't get it. Fine. Again, I'm just speaking my truth and having been involved in politics my whole life. Every single thing that you care about will not happen if Donald Trump gets reelected. And it can happen. And much of it will happen if Joe Biden gets in, even though he is not the greatest candidate on God's green earth. I will agree right. with you on that. <laughs> well, I mean, one issue I have with how people see elections in general is it, it, they reduce it to these two personalities, right? And I mean, there's so many other things that are connected to the two parties and basically two ways of looking at government, right? So there, we're talking about thousands of political appointments. We're talking about you know the Supreme Court talking about all sorts of policies. We're talking about people who um, are going to actually make the laws, right? Not just the, the person in charge of the executive branch, but like all the lawmakers, like the lawmaking that happens, like, you know, we, we have to make decisions about that. So I just, I, I kind of bristle when people reduce this election to just two personalities and make well, these um, judgments like, oh, I don't like him or I don't trust him. When I, to me, it, they're just, it, we're talking about like entire system, a completely different system of, of how to govern. And that's what you know, Trump has really introduced is not just that he's conservative or he's Republican, he's really made corruption completely out in the open. Like he, he, he just, he shamelessly profits from being in this position of power. I mean, it's a, it's a completely different kind of animal that he has introduced, even though some people might say, well, he's just a symptom and he's not the cause. Well, symptoms can also catalyze incredibly devastating destruction. <laughs> and to me, he's been absolutely destructive on our democracy. So the, the way I see our situation is that we're not talking about Biden. To me, it's like our democracy is on the line. And if we lose our democracy, how are we gonna have any change? We were so, not gonna get any change. So I, I'm so glad you said that, Annabelle. So I'm a lawyer and every single lawyer that I know is freaked out. And why are we freaked out? Because the literally the institutions of our democracy are almost completely gone already. And imagine another four years of this. But here's the thing. Here's the game of politics. Let me just share this. I've been working on this for years. 
even if you didn't like Hillary, there was a reason to vote for her. Even if you don't like Joe Biden, there's a reason to vote. And here it is. It's because politics is a game. It's like Fortnite, but much, much simpler, right? You can win this game if by knowing second grade arithmetic, that's it. So in order to get anything done, so for example, you want to pass the DREAM Act, right? Um, you want to pass climate legislation. You want to pass the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, HR4. They're gonna rename that for John Lewis almost for sure. You want to get money out of politics. You wanna have equal pay for women. You wanna legalize marijuana federally. You want to expunge the records of every African-American and Hispanic and white person who's ever been arrested for simple possession of marijuana. That's the Marijuana Justice Act. Cory Booker has put that forward, right? You wanna end factory farms, right? Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have put that bill forward. You can get anything that you want in our system of government, not because of who the president is, that's only one person, but you need 218 people who believe in that issue in the House, and then it passes the House, and then 60 who believe in that, who will support that in the Senate, and then one person who will sign it. In our government, we need 279 people to make anything happen. And the, the president has some executive authority, right, appointing Supreme Court justices and cabinet members and all of that. But to get major legislation that will change and transform America, we need 279, 218 plus 60 plus one. Donald Trump or Joe Biden would be that one person. So you're not, the way I look at it, I'll give you an analogy. We hire these people. We hire them to be, to carry out our desire. So if your toilet explodes at midnight one night and you call a plumber, and that plumber comes, you do not really care how nice that plumber is, how intelligent that plumber is, how warm and friendly and smart and, and handsome or beautiful that plumber is, right? You just want the plumber to do the fricking job. Just do the job, fix the toilet, I'll give you your money and then you leave. And that's what we do for a president. We have to look at this more transactionally and less emotionally, because we're not going to have the transformations that we are emotional about unless we have the people who support our values and our policies. And as Annabelle was saying, as we're looking at what's going on with the coronavirus, right? Nancy Pelosi months ago passed a $3 trillion bill to take care of people who are suffering during this crisis. Mitch McConnell and, and the Republicans in the Senate, they, they went home for the weekend. And mm -hmm. they, even though people are being evicted, even though people are losing their unemployment insurance money, they, I mean, the Republicans only care about power and corporations and money. They do not care about people. I wish it wasn't true. It didn't used to be true, but it is now. It used to be that Republicans and Democrats were more, more or less the same and whatever, but they are so different in their values, right? So if you want what you want, you might want to think about stop demonizing mm -hmm. the Democratic National Committee and Tom Perez and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi or whoever. They're working as hard as they can to get to this 279. And sometimes they make choices that you may not like, but mm -hmm. that's the answer. So you know, the Republicans are way smarter than we are. They are way smarter than we are. They looked at Joe, they looked at Donald Trump after the Access Hollywood tape and even before, and they said, this guy is a disgusting pig, right? He cheats on his wife, he blah, 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 all of that, right? But I'm gonna hold my nose and I'm gonna vote for him because there is something more important than the personality of one human being that's gonna be in there for four or eight years. And that is the Supreme Court. And for them, that is second amendment issues, that is gay rights issues, which they didn't necessarily win on all the time, but definitely it is reproductive choice and pro-life. They voted for Donald Trump because Mitch McConnell geniusly said no to Barack Obama, 
said no to Merrick Garland and kept that seat open so that Christian evangelicals would vote for a non-Christian pig because of the, the one seat, which then turned into two and might turn into three or four seats on the Supreme Court so that they could get something that was deeply emotionally and emotionally personal for them, which was ending abortion, mm -hmm. overturning Roe v. Wade. And I just think we have to be smart. We're smarter than this, right? Okay. To not vote or to, and, and to allow Donald Trump to get four more years is not as smart as who we are. We're smarter mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, um, I just want to address um, Lucas, who's commented a lot yesterday and today, who feels um, like he can't trust the Democratic Party. He's a progressive. He likes, he's the one who liked Warren. Uh, he probably liked Bernie. Um, and he doesn't, he just doesn't trust them. And he thinks that they've been bought, right? There's a money in politics problem in the Democratic. Let me just finish that. He's, there's a money in politics problem in the Democratic Party. Um, and he feels like the progressives really don't get heard. They don't have enough power in the Democratic Party. And in in and I and I am sympathetic to this. Like and and he feels frustrated. I feel frustrated. I feel like uh, things that that could have become um, that could have been fixed during the Obama years didn't get fixed. That then and, and he made decisions that uh, could have led to better results. Anyway, so my point is, instead of just calling Lucas a troll or whatever a saboteur or uh, irresponsible. I want to take this on. I want to take on um, this idea that um, you know progressives really don't have enough power in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is full of professionals. Um, there's the donor class. There's just too much money schlossing around. There are people that we can't trust. Like things need to change in the Democratic Party. So that's one. The second thing is that, um, and this is I'm addressing Lucas. Second thing is I, Lucas, and you know anyone who sympathizes with, with this view, I just want you to kind of think about it this way. Like the people you do like, like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, Ro Khanna, AOC, all these progressives in Congress right now, um, they're not going to have as much impact. They're not going to have as much power if they have to deal with Donald Trump in the executive branch, vetoing whatever may pass through Congress, right? Even if it passes both House and the Senate, if, if Trump is reelected and he vetoes every one of their bills, we're not gonna get anywhere. We're gonna have much better chance as progressives. You know, all the things that Bernie and Warren and AOC, they want, like we have a much better shot at passing them with Joe Biden as president. Okay, so right. I just I just want you to understand we're talking about the balance of power. We're going to give Bernie and Warren much more power if we have Joe Biden as president, even if you don't like him, even if you don't trust them, even if you don't like the Democratic Party. And I, I I'm very sympathetic to the criticisms of of the institution, and I do believe things need to change. Well. Uh, Thank you, Lucas, because I hear this all the time, all the time. And and I have to tell you that, in my opinion, and again, I personally know 20 or 30 members of Congress. And I've had conversations with them about how hard it is to get the kinds of things that you and I both want. And I'll tell you why it's hard. For example, let's go back to what I said. The game of politics in America right now is you need 279 people to agree with you on anything, on a Green New Deal, on Medicare for all, on all the things that you probably want. You need 218 in the House and you need 60 in the United States Senate. How many do we have in the United States Senate right now? We have 47. And because we don't even have a majority, Mitch McConnell is the majority leader, which means he doesn't even have to take up any of these bills. So we don't even have a chance to have them get voted on or a chance to have them get filibustered. Now, the reason Barack Obama was not able to accomplish very much is because Mitch McConnell and the Republicans 
decided as soon as this black man was elected that they were going to stop everything he did. You've heard about that. It has been reported for a long time. And the way you do that, even when you're in the minority, is you filibuster everything that Barack Obama wants, everything that the progressive Democrats wanted in the Senate, right? And there was only a period of seven months in eight years where the Democrats had 60 votes, but they didn't necessarily have 60 progressive votes. They had a senator from Nebraska named Ben Nelson, who was kind of a conservative, but he helped them get the majority and he helped them get to 60. So it's just a game. It's a second grade arithmetic game, right? And But we need that person who is more progressive than the other person to be in the White House, because Annabelle's right. Let's say you got 60 people in the Senate or they ended the Senate, the filibuster rule, which I would suggest, we could pass every single piece of legislation that you want and Donald Trump would veto it. And you know what the number is? It's all numbers in politics. It's just arithmetic. The number is you need two thirds of both houses to override a veto. You're never gonna get that. You're never gonna get that. So essentially, if we allow Donald Trump to be reelected, even if we get everybody else we want in the Senate and the House, we're still not gonna get this progressive legislation. But to the larger point, the perception that the DNC and the Democratic Party are anti-progressive is complete bullshit. It just is. And I can prove it to you, okay? So I study pieces of legislation. I don't care what politicians say. I care how they vote. I care how they vote. And hopefully you will too. So you talked about getting money out of politics. The most sweeping democracy reform, the most sweeping election reform that has ever been introduced into the United States Congress was introduced at the beginning of Nancy Pelosi's term as speaker in this current session. It's called HR1. They gave it number one because it's the most important thing to Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats in the House of Representatives. It's called the Government for the People Act. And it will completely begin the transformation with the limitations of Citizens United, of course, in the way a little bit, the transformation of money and politics in the United States. It's an incredible bill. Also, things like a, a voter register, you know, automatic voter registration across the country. Fantastic bill. Lucas, do you know how many Democrats, how many of these horrible corporatist neoliberal Democrats voted for it? I know you can't answer. I mean, you could chat, but let me answer it for everybody. Every single one of them. Every single one of the Democrats from red districts, from purple districts from blue districts, every single Democrat voted for the most progressive election reform, democracy reform bill that has been introduced in the United States Congress in generations. The same thing for HR3, the Elijah Cummings um, bill to lower prescription drug prices for seniors. The same thing for HR4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which will be renamed for John Lewis, every single Democrat and virtually no Republicans or no Republicans. HR5 is the Equality Act, every single Democrat. HR6 is the DREAM Act, every single Democrat. HR7 is the Equal Pay for Women, uh, Paycheck uh, Fairness Act. That every single Democrat voted for HR7. HR8 was the uh, bipartisan, bipartisan, because it had like eight votes from Republicans, the Bipartisan Background Checks Act of 2019. Every single Democrat. And then HR9, the Climate Action Now Act. Every single Democrat. And then more recently, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I think there was one or two Democrats who didn't vote for that. But other than that, every single Democrat voted for it. Ending net, I mean, restoring net neutrality. Every single Democrat voted for it. So the truth is there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. Is every Democrat in the House and the Senate as progressive as my friend Ro Khanna or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or AOC who gave one of the greatest speeches in the history of the United States House of Representatives? No, but those things that they're pushing take time. The Green New Deal 
is taking a little bit of time. It'll get there. Medicare for all will probably get there and other things that they're talking about will probably get there, but you need 60 votes in the Senate and you're not anywhere near that. So I want everybody to just calm down, understand that the vast, 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 vast majority of Democrats, in fact, all of them that voted on these progressive bills in the House of Representatives are much more progressive as a party and individually than you think. We just need more of them in the United mm -hmm. States Senate and one of them in the White House. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, that's it. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry so if that's... I'm so passionate because I've been, I've been hearing this for so long. Mm -hmm. And again, I am in constant communication with members of the House and some members of the Senate. And it's just not true. These people are fighting their asses off. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, and I admire and appreciate the passion. Um, I there think is some passion what, there. Yeah. Um, the thing I want to say, though, is the reason why I'm sympathetic to the criticisms of the Democratic Party, and I, and I, I agree with your analysis. I don't disagree with your analysis, but I, I do feel like um, I do agree with Thomas Frank's kind of criticism that there are just way too many um, professional consultants. There's a kind of elitism also, but there are just so many people who run Democratic Party and Washington. Um, and I just, I do feel like we need to figure out how to create a party that's much more responsive to the grassroots, like people who are on the front lines, people who are volunteering at the, at this, at the county, state levels. Um, and I, I just don't think that's happening. I, I think the balance of power is like with consultants and people in Washington and not with the grassroots volunteers um, at the, at the but, county but and Annabelle, state level. Look what happened, yeah. look what happened in terms of grassroots protests and, and communication, right? the George Floyd homicide happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And within, within two and a half weeks, you had a bill that completely transforms policing in America. It ends chokeholds, it ends no-knock warrants, it, it mm -hmm. ends the limited immunity for policemen to be sued federally, on and on and on. Na Nancy Pelosi has her finger on the pulse of a progressive America. She is a progressive. And yeah, no, I don't, care, I, I don't care how many consultants yeah. there are. Look, the proof is in the pudding. Okay, what well, about how the Democratic Party is organized, right? Um, so I'm not talking necessarily about these moments of incredible, um, you know, collective organizing, collective action, like we had with George Floyd, which was, you know, extraordinary. But I'm saying, like, at the at, when when you're talking about how the party operates. Like state parties have very little money, very little power. You know, at the at the committee level, I mean, there's very little resources, even in battleground states, for people to get the training that they need. And you know, volunteers just I, I don't there's just not a lot of emphasis on building up kind of the grassroots volunteer that because we could be quite an army. And so I'm just saying there I personally would like to see a shift to really resourcing people at the state and county and district level so that the grassroots is engaged and they feel heard on a day-to-day -day basis, not when there's like a, just a total you know, catastrophe like the George Floyd death, you know? So, so, so that's one of the things I think that really needs to be reformed. But um, in, in any case, then, I mean, that's then sort people, of- then people, then people should run to be representatives of the Democratic Party in their, yeah. in, either in, in state Democratic Party, county Democratic Party, or the Absolutely. DNC. I mean, Absolutely. it's all it's all about numbers. You get enough people who agree with what you said, and I do, I think it'd be great, mm -hmm. but no, there's no political organization that's perfect, right? It's the question is where are their values and what are they trying to do? And if you sat down with Tom Perez, I'm sure you guys would agree on virtually everything. And you just have to make choices sometimes. There are limited resources and you have to choose to put your money someplace rather than another. The truth is, here's the bottom line. I mean, I, I think every, I think 75% of Americans 
are Democrats. They just don't know it. And we need to do a much better job of branding this party so that we can even drive more participation so that people can be out in, at the grassroots level and, and contributing things like you talked about. But nothing happens unless we win elections. And that's why if everybody votes, even mm -hmm. though you don't think the Democratic Party is perfect or their candidates are perfect, but you vote for Democrats, the difference in values and policies between Democrats mm -hmm. and any other party is mm -hmm. astounding. Okay. Okay. Let me let me make a proposal here. Um, okay. I, you know, you know, I travel a lot around the country and I go to places where I see a good organizing or places that need help, need volunteers or whatnot. Um, everywhere I've gone to in this country, I have met people who feel like they're not being heard. Okay. okay. They are in their struggling um, or they just don't feel like anyone cares to hear about their struggles. They're just, they just don't feel heard. And I think it's extremely important as, as we go forward, um, we gotta like do a better job of really listening to people and listening to each other. And so what I, what I wanna ask you to do, and, and, I, and this is not a criticism of you at all because I completely admire and respect like all the work you're doing and the knowledge you have, it's just that I just, I just want you to make room for taking the time to like listen to why people are so upset. You know, even if so you don't agree with the analysis, but I think let, it's very important for people to feel like they're being heard, you know? Right. So yeah. here's where here's where you might see some impatience on my part. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh huh. So I actually have taught courses on uh, communication around the world, mm -hmm. including courses on listening. But for me. I just know the political reality. And the truth is the people who most want to be listened to when they have the opportunity to really have people in high places that can make a difference, that have the power to listen to them, they don't talk. And that's elections. So if, you talk, if, you, if we look at the demographics of the people who don't vote, that's what the people in power pay attention to. Why should they listen to 18 to 29 year olds, for example, when 18 to 29 year olds in the last presidential election and in midterms, it's way less. 2018 was better, but it's still low. 46.1 percent of 18 to 29 year olds voted in the 2016 election. 70.9 percent of people 65 and over voted. So if you're a politician, are you going to listen to someone who's not going to vote or are you going to listen to someone who is going to vote? Now, I know you're going to say, but if they did listen, then we would be more likely to vote. But there's limited time and they're going for low hanging fruit. I'm going to I'm going to pay attention to the older people because I know if I don't do what they want. They're going to vote me out. Younger people, they don't vote. Mitt Romney just talked about this, too. So the reason Trump is going to win, in his opinion, is because young people don't vote. And minorities don't vote either. African-American voting is incredibly low, except for elderly African-American women who vote the highest percentage of anybody. God bless them. Because they were around during the, 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 the Martin Luther King times and the John Lewis times, and they know how incredibly important. I encourage everyone to watch the movie Selma. And, and Hispanic populations, demographics, don't generally vote either. So it's a little bit of a, of a, of a catch-22 here. You want me to listen to you, but then if I listen to you, you're not going to do anything to, to, to stand up for what you're saying. Whereas these other people, they're going to they're gonna fire me unless I listen to them. So I, I know that's not the complete answer, and it's probably not satisfying. But again, politicians are people, and they are very pragmatic sometimes. But... So tell me what I should hear. What should someone who is advocating like I'm advocating or a politician, what do they need to know that they don't know because they're not listening? Well, I think um, 
I think we have to be open to hearing um, potential solutions to the things that make people feel like they're, they feel powerless or not heard. You know, because I have heard this from people all around the country and even people who have spent like their lives volunteering for the Democratic Party. You know, they just don't feel like um, it's a it's a democratic process in the Democratic Party that a few people hold a lot of power and that there's that the, the resources get concentrated into institutions like DCCC and DLCC and DNC and and so on. And so I just think there, there of course, are solutions to this. I, I think there, there are ways to make the Democratic Party feel more democratic. Um, Anyway, so but so I just think we have to be more open to hearing ways to make it better instead of getting too defensive. And like any criticism of the Democratic Party is somehow an attempt at sabotage. I don't think I mean, that's not well, true. There are people but, who uh, I think can come up with real, real, really good ideas about how to make it better so that more people will want to engage more people will want to they, they feel a sense of ownership with it. Right. So so everything can be transformed. Everything that everyone who's watching this, who is a progressive, wants can happen more and more and very quickly can happen by young people, people of color, progressives, not whining, but voting. And then when you have a Congress and state legislatures and governor mansions and the White House and city councils and mayor's offices, filled with people like Ro Khanna and AOC and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, you don't even have to talk because they're right there with you. So all we have to do is elect more people and then the DCCC or the, the DLC or whatever it is will have, have very little power because there will be nobody in it. You'll have a Democratic Party that is flush with a vast majority of progressives. And that can only happen if young people and people of color actually vote. They say, you know what? The Democratic Party is not perfect, but I'm gonna help make it better with my vote for every single person on the ballot that is a progressive Democrat, and especially in primaries, or run yourself. The, the, yeah. the criticism of the consulting class. So for example, I have a friend who is very strongly advocating for regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. And it's an issue that doesn't get a lot of play because you've got your big ag companies that have lots of lobbyists all over the place. And yes, they do influence Democratic members of Congress and state legislators mm -hmm. as well. So I am in favor of doing what you're doing and having open conversation about new alternatives and other issues. But the quickest way to get regenerative agriculture to be the way that we do agriculture and to get rid of Monsanto and Roundup and all of that is to elect more people who think like you, not just to have the current horrible politicians do the, the dance of listening to you, or the, DF, the DNC, do the dance of listening to you. Fill the DNC with progressives. Fill Congress and the state houses with progressives. And then we get everything we want. And then we can not just talk about those issues, but we can actually pass laws to implement them. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we. I think we... I mean, I, I guess what my, my response to that is, I agree with you in theory. It's just that to me, it shouldn't be this hard. There shouldn't be so much opposition to things that are progressive, you know, like regenerative agriculture. Like we shouldn't have Monsanto have as much influence as it does even among Democrats, right? Well, and so- well, but Hold on, let, let me address yeah. that. So my, uh -huh. my dear friend, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, who is this awesome, she's like the RBG of the house. She's this, almost 80 year old, incredibly wonderful woman. She introduced a piece of legislation into the United States House of Representatives to ban Monsanto Roundup. Do people know about that? No. If we got 218 people in the House to support that piece of legislation and 60 in the Senate to support that legislation and a president 
like Joe Biden, not Donald Trump, who would sign it, we could not just be talking about getting rid of Monsanto. We could actually get rid of Monsanto. So anyway, I think mm-hmm. I, I, I hear you. Um, I think it's an evolutionary process of mm-hmm. reforming politics at the, at the party level. The DNC is not perfect. They do things that I disagree with as well. But again, it always comes back to what we started this whole thing with. Donald Trump and the Republicans are going to do everything they can to suppress mm-hmm. your vote. Yeah, right? no, I totally agree with you. And, and I, to me, there's no comparison between Biden and Trump, no comparison between Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The Republican Party, really, I, I feel like, is out to kill me. I mean, I honestly feel they're evil. Um, so it's not that I see any kind of equivalency. It's more like, I just want our institutions to be more democratic, starting with the Democratic Party. I want okay. grassroots organizers to be prioritized and heard in a systematic so, way. Yeah. So I'll do something. This should make you happy. So okay. I, I sent Tom Perez an email mm-hmm. yesterday mm-hmm. about something. You send me an email, Annabelle, about what you want the, the DNC to do right? Specific things, just like we were talking about that represent what the people who watch you, you know, would like and how you'd like to reform that. And I will send that email to uh, uh, Tom Perez and also Christine Pelosi, who's um, on the board of the DNC. Okay. Well, I can give you an example right now. I want it in writing. (laughs) Okay. Well, no, let me just, let me just put this out there. Okay. Every single email I get from the DNC right now, is a solicitation email asking me for money. And that's right. the way it's been, not just an election year, okay? Any email, I can go through my email search. Every single email is about asking me for money, okay? I want them to ask us for our opinion and take that seriously, okay? And put it into some sort of a process. They're actively listening. They're actively soliciting our opinion okay Okay. not 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 to raise a few dollars saying oh okay here you you gave us opinion give us two dollars no i want them to care about what people actually think okay and not just spam us multiple times a day for money (laughs) so i'm with you a hundred percent i think these emails and i get them too are disgusting i think it's obscene but hold on hold on Hold on, okay. hold on, but we have the solution. The solution is public financing of campaigns and to get money completely out of politics. And that can only happen by passing HR1 and moving towards a public financing system and then getting another Supreme, a few more Democratic Supreme Court justices and overruling Citizens United. That's what we want. I find the whole, I ran for Congress. I think the money in politics is disgusting. It's, it's, it's prostitution, it's, it's horrible. And I agree with you. But uh, when you're getting 100 days in front of an election, uh, people are only caring about how many ads can they buy on social media and on television or on radio and how are they gonna get elected? So uh, there's not gonna be a lot of receptivity for not raising money at this point, but I agree. And I think it could be done way better than, so let's you and I talk about that. Okay, Any, anything else? Your, your audience has been very patient. We've been going for a while. Thank you, Richard. I'm sure we have many more conversations. I invite you to come whenever you like to share your ideas and concerns and you know, um, give us um, some sort of guidance as we go forward because it's, it's gonna be crazy. So I appreciate- so I just wanna yeah. close it mm-hmm. by saying, mm-hmm. just to kind of come full circle. So I think there's a new politics that mm-hmm is available for us, a new approach to it. Instead of focusing on the personalities of the individual candidates or on the political parties, to focus on what is it that you really, really want? What's the most important thing to you, right? Is it fighting climate change? Is it equality for gay people? Is it equality for dreamers? Is it policing? Is it changing how we do elections? Is it uh, voting rights? any number of things, right? Is it abortion on one side or the other? Obviously on on this community, it's gonna be on one side. And if we focus on specific 
concrete things that we really want. And then we look at elections as a hiring process that we're hiring for two years or four years or six years. We're hiring proxies. Say, you know what, I'm gonna hire you. I'm gonna vote for you if you promise to vote for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, or you promise to vote for the Green New Deal or Medicare for All. That way, and, and I will vote. You do your part, you give me the commitment, I'll do my part, and I'm gonna vote for you, and I'm gonna crowdsource everyone I know to vote for you and others like you. So it's let's focus on bills, let's vote for bills and results, not for parties, or and definitely not for ultimately flawed individuals. And every human being is flawed. If Jesus Christ himself were a candidate for president, you would have the opposing party picturing him as the worst human being who's ever lived, as a pedophile, as a- As, as a, a communist. As a, as as a, a communist. communist. Exactly. So let's, <laughs> let's be smart. Let's move beyond this cult of personality around these idealized fantasy figures that we, we project on yeah. our political leaders. And let's say, Joe Biden, I think you're disgusting, but are you going to sign the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act if it makes it through the Senate. And Joe Biden would say, yes, Joe Biden, I think you're disgusting, but are you gonna yeah. sign the Climate Action Now Act? So I think that's the new politics. Um, and, right. and, and that's in that way we get everything we want. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Richard. I take issue with you that you believe I'm flawed. I don't think I am flawed. I'm just kidding. I didn't say you were flawed. <laughs> I just said every human being is flawed. Anyway, okay, I'm except kidding. for you, except for Annabelle Park, because I saw I'm you. Kidding. I met you in a church. I met you in one of the most important churches in America. So you're clearly a saintly was, figure like John yeah. Lewis. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so Thanks much, so Richard. Much. I appreciate this conversation. You're invited to come back anytime, literally, really anytime. Uh, we can we can do this again. And I appreciate you answering all my questions. Okay. And I'm gonna go through I'm gonna go through the comments afterwards. Yes, and, and Margie had a bunch of comments that um, you should respond I'm, to. Yeah. I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. <laughs> okay. And prove that. And I will respond to every comment that I can. Okay. Thanks, Annabelle. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Okay. Take, Take care, care Richard. Bye. Bye. All right. You've been listening to Conversations About a Way Forward from Count Me In to Win and The Talk on Main Street. To learn more, find us on Facebook at The Talk on Main Street.